Mr. Foster, thank you so much for coming here today. I'm really grateful for you taking the time. I've admired Reebok success as a, a brand for, I mean, my whole life. I've, I was, I was born in 1995, just to give you some context. And so you had already sold the company, but <laughs> it, it's still a remarkable feat. And, and I admire you tremendously. So thank you for uh, being here today. Thank you, Danny. It's uh, it's a real pleasure. It really is. And uh, it's good that somebody as young as you would want, in fact, to talk to me. <laughs> yes. Because by that time, I'd <laughs> retired. By the time you were born, I'd been retired five years from the Reebok company. So, uh, yes, there we go. Wow. 95. Yes. Excellent. So thank you. My pleasure. And um, I guess we'll get into you selling the company. We'll get into that. But I guess a good place to start for some context would be, I think you might be the first guest of mine who's lived during World War II. I'm not 100% sure of that, but I might need to fact check it. But I if that is true, that. like, what is it like to live during World War II? Well, can you remember being four years old? Because... World War II started when Barely. I was four, and it ended when I was 10. So what you remember between four and 10 is all the exciting bits. Okay, we, uh, we, we had funny things like double summertime. So you know how our clocks move forward and backwards? Well, I was moved forward twice. So we had very late, light nights. It was like 11 o'clock at night, it was still light, and this was all to do with being able to manufacture during the war and the different things that go on during the war. <clears throat> but uh, as a kid of uh, four years old to ten years old, really, you, you don't know. That's life. <laughs> That's it. You know, you grow up doing these things. You don't have any fear because you don't know what it's about. Um, we we live ten miles just north of Manchester, so Bolton itself was not a target. But Manchester was a target, and we could see uh, the glow of flames as we, because Bolton was higher than Manchester, so we could look across and down at Manchester. So you could see the uh, where the bombs had dropped and the uh, all the flames. But apart from that, it's you know you, you, you're just living. You're outside with the with your friends. You're running around the streets, and there's no lights on. There's no lights on because everything had to be uh, pitch black so that any air raid bombers couldn't see lights and drop bombs on it. So uh, I guess really at the end of the war, when all the lights came on, the street lights came on, everything. At night, you could see so many different things. So life changed when I was 10. And you, you got a different life. And <clears throat> we also had education because during the war, there was not much education. Most of the teachers, they were in the army. They were fighting. So uh, we did have mm. little bits of education. But even our school was taken over by the uh, uh, authorities, as I think they called it an, an air raid post, somewhere where they had uh, got the home guard, I think, in those days, were sort of occupying it. So, yeah, it changed then. But as a child during the war, you tend to remember the good things, which is funny, but you do. <laughs> How much of that experience informed what you would start when you're 25? Does that experience at all impact Reebok in any way? I think there's, it is probably a period in history when, of course, uh, normal life, as we might have known it, had stopped. And so everything was not normal. And uh, a bit like COVID, we had nowhere to go. <laughs> People stayed in. You know, we used to go, mm. I believe, on holidays to the seaside and do the normal things that you do. Um, all that stopped. People, and two reasons. One is that uh, they didn't want you to be moving around the country. And the other one is we didn't have any petrol in those days. It was, you had to have coupons to buy petrol. So my father, although my father had a car, we couldn't go very far. So, uh, but what we did, both Jeff and myself, we were part of the scouting movement. So even at a young age, we became part of the scouting movement, which taught you a lot of discipline. Funnily enough, you learn to do a lot. Mm. And it is 
And we, it was part of a very good scouting troop that we were part of. So we learned an awful lot. And a lot of it was self-reliance. You learn to rely on your own judgment. Mm. And, and I think that does help you. When probably did help us when we, uh, when we uh, were a bit older. But also, um, at the age of 18, both Jeff and myself did national service. Jeff was two years older than me. We, in other words, I went in the RAF, the Air Force, and Jeff went in the Army, and he went to Germany and saw Adidas and Puma. And we worked at Foster's, and mm. Foster's, of course, my grandfather, inventing the running spike in 1895. Um, and so we grew up with that as a family. But we didn't realize how badly my father and uncle were running the company until we did our national service and came back. Mm. When we came back, we saw it was a failing company, which, of course, is, is not good when you're only uh, 20. Jeff was 22, and we come back to a failing company. So we had to do something. How do you know it was a failing company? Would you just had access to the books, or what was, what was the indication? You, they weren't selling as many... They weren't in profit. Like, how do you know? Well, uh, <clears throat> we could see Adidas and what Adidas were doing. We could see them, their presence in the sports goods shops. We could see their presence. And the presence of the Foster shoes, they were not there. Um, you know, we, we, we had a sort of, we'll, we'll say, the athletic season. Started somewhere in February and went all the way through to September. But the Foster season seemed to be going smaller and smaller. And orders that used to come in in February were not coming in now till March or even late March. And uh, the season was getting over. People were also, you were seeing the other brands. So, and we weren't, we weren't reacting. Never mind being sort of, uh, I can say, looking at how do I build our business? No, it's how do we survive? And funnily enough, uh, when you go away, we went national service. What happens in national service? Well, you go away from home. Don't know if you live on your own or whether you still with your parents, but this took us away. <clears throat> Mother's no longer there. She's not doing your washing. She's not looking after all the bits and pieces and father's not providing you with your income. So you begin to think differently. You begin to think, hmm, I've got to make, you know, what can I do here? How can I, how can I win out here? I used to be a badminton player and uh, possibly reasonable and uh, the forces. The forces love sport. They love to be participating in sport. And with a bit of luck, I was seen by one of the senior RAF people. And after nine months of doing what I should be doing in the RAF, they took me away and I just played badminton then for the rest of my time, the rest of my two years in the RAF, I played badminton. So I enjoyed it. It was great fun. Uh, <clears throat> but you learn how to, how to do this. Yeah, well, yeah, I'll come, I'll do this. And so you, you, you learn how to win. I think, I think that's a, a thing you've got to do yeah. in force. You learn how to win. Yeah, I can do this. So I guess that scouting and two years of national service sort of gave me something that maybe had there been no war, maybe that wouldn't have happened. Maybe we wouldn't have seen any difference in the family business <laughs> and we would have gone down with it, but we didn't. We saw the difference and we had to change. And I've heard you mention badminton, badminton before in other podcasts and how you, were, you loved badminton. And I'm curious, it sounds like that played a, a big part of your, a big part of your life. So I'm curious if, that taught you anything about business playing so much and if that is related to Reebok at all? Um, <clears throat> very little, I think, badminton, because we, uh, we produce athletic shoes. Badminton, you need a different, different footwear. You need, in those days, we used to have uh, Plimsoll's shoes made by Dunlop and uh, I, think, uh, <clears throat> I think Tiger. Um, Asics, the call today. Asics used to do rubber molding, so there were, it were different uh, different footwear. <clears throat> I did try to make badminton shoe, but there's too much toe drag. You drag your foot too much, and so you, you can pull the sole off. You just drag the sole. Mm. So <clears throat> uh, I think badminton was sort of something that uh, 
okay, I, I obviously played a reasonable game. <clears throat> and uh, so that was good. And I do think that uh, being in the RAF, what it does for me doing the national service, what it did teach me is that you can find a way in this world in a different way if you try. And uh, so, so it was it was good that I could play badminton, and it's good that it took me away from just doing two years of working on radar, um, <clears throat> and and enjoying myself. Because again, I think that is part of business. A big part of business is to enjoy it. You've got to enjoy life. If you don't enjoy what you're doing, don't do it. But so I'm enjoying badminton. I enjoy mm. business. It uh, it teaches you to yeah have fun and. I think playing a sport is fun, and, you know, and I think that's a major, major essence in, uh, in in being in business and having a business is to have a lot of fun and enjoy it. Mm. Well, it sounds like you had a lot of fun, but I also understand that you describe 1958 to 1979 as the early days of the business, which is just interesting to think about 21 years being the early days of the business yes. and i'm curious what fun you were having then in the early days you know you weren't a global brand at that point but you were still having fun i assume so what about those early days was so much fun well i think what is uh, what is good fun is that you're you're designing a product you're able to make a product you're meeting a lot of people and you're making friends and you you're working out you're working out how do i sell more shoes tomorrow how do i uh increase the image the image of the company is so important uh i'm talking of a sports brand if you've got a a, a low price low quality image you might sell some volume because of price but uh i, I think when it comes to uh to Reebok, we, we wanted a good image. We wanted our image to be of the best. And, uh, and, and I think that is always a challenge. How do you make sure that the, the image that you portray, your product, is the best? So, and that is fun. Yeah? It's, you enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it. So, and, and fun is probably not laughing all day. It's probably not sort of doing silly things all day. No, it's doing some very serious things sometimes, <laughs> very serious. You, you know, you come up with a new design. Um, and you haven't read the book, but we started off as Mercury Sports Footwear. That was our original name. We left the parent company of J.W. Foster, um, and we thought, we need a name for our company. We know why we've got to leave. We've got to leave because this company is going down, and we, we need a company which is growing. So we came up with Mercury Sports Footwear, and our logo was the Winged Messenger, Mercury. The Winged, that was our logo. We loved that. We thought that was great. <clears throat> and we're only 18 months into our business. And our accountant said, you're making money? Well, great, yeah. So you better register that name. Okay, why? And we, we're only 22, 23, and uh, yeah, why? Why, why? why do we need to do that? Well... Um, they came to him. If somebody else also thinks that Re that uh, Mercury are nice shoes, good shoes, and they decide they will make some Mercury shoes, well, you're gonna you're gonna have a fight. You're gonna be in court. You're gonna be saying, "Just a minute, you're pinching my name." Then you've got to prove it. Why do that? Just register it. Mm -hmm. okay, we'll register our name. Mm -hmm. But we tried, uh, and the patent agent I went to see found out that this was already pre-registered. So we, uh, oh, we were disappointed. pre reg Somebody else has got the name. British Shoe Corporation. They're a big company. Uh, uh, British Shoe Corporation. They're not using it. They're not. Um, what can we do? Well, they offered it to us for £1,000. Now, £1,000 in those days was a reasonable amount of money. Um, Jeff and I, we'd just set up a whole factory for £250. Sounds cheap, but we could buy machinery for ten pounds. So for two hundred and fifty pounds, we just set up a company. So we couldn't afford a thousand pounds. Well, the uh, the lawyer said, "Well, because they're not using it, you can actually take them to court and 
claim it because they're not using it. So I said, how much will it cost us to take it to court? He said, a thousand pounds. So <laughs> buy it or take them to court, we couldn't afford either. And that's when he said, OK, then, if you can't do that, you'll have to bring me a, a new name, a new name. Which was like, that's our foot. We're, we're only 18 months into our business, and the first thing we find is we've not got a name. All of a sudden, we have no name. What do we do? Well, the, the lawyer pointed through his window to Kodak. And I'm saying, well, what's with Kodak? He said, well, they invented the name. That's, they made it up. That's their name. It doesn't mean anything. You know, we all know what Mercury is, but nobody knows what Kodak is apart from Kodak. Okay, so he said, <clears throat> bring me a made-up name. That's fine. He said, but don't bring me one name. Bring me ten. And ten? Hmm. Why do you need ten names? We only want one. Well, he said, we have to put this through the register. And if somebody else has already pre-registered that name, We'll be going for six months, nine months, if you go one name at a time. Bring me ten, we'll put them all in, and we'll see what comes out. And I'm sort of saying, but just a minute, this is our business. We, we've got to be in love with this. So this is, you know, we have to have a passion for it. But he's a lawyer. Does he care? No. He's just a lawyer. He just goes through the process. Okay. So we go, I go back and we sit around the table, just like we are doing now. And we're thinking of new names. Ten, ten new names. And uh, Cougar, Cougar Sports. Does that sound good? Yeah, so I put it on the list. Falcon Sports. Does that sound good? Yeah, that's okay. Put it on the list. Now I'm going to take you back to 1943, middle of World War Two. And uh, like with COVID, nothing's going on. But we did have local events, and I am entered into a local race, a running race, a 60 yard race. And uh, I win. I win. Well, I do have an advantage. I had foster spikes. Nobody else had spikes in those days, certainly not my age, eight years old. But I win the race. And uh, I go to collect my prize. Oh, right, collect your prize. Here we go. And what do I get? A dictionary. A dictionary. And I'm saying, come on, guys, where's the football? Well, you know, where's the football? What? Why a dictionary? Well, I got a dictionary. And it was an American dictionary. It was a Webster's. And here we are, middle of World War II, and I pick up a Webster's American dictionary. And I'm pretty disgusted. Not that it was American, but the fact that it was a dictionary. So, right. So now let's fast forward. We're now at 1960, and my American dictionary is sat here next to me. Where um, was that dictionary staying? I don't know. I mean, I, I obviously didn't do much with it when I was, uh, when I wanted eight years old. I think I just, that was it, in a corner. And it stayed in a corner until, obviously, I moved and took it with me um, to the office at that point. <laughs> so I'm looking at it, and I like the letter R. I thought, letter R, brilliant. Yeah, strong. So uh, I'm looking through my American, I turn to the letter R in the American Dictionary, and I'm turning the pages, and it's not long before I come across R-E-E-B-O-K, -E Reebok, what's that? And uh, I read it, it's a small South African gazelle. Gazelle, fantastic, we're a running company. Gazelle, absolutely, that's it, top of the list. Reebok is top of the list. Uh, so I take this list back to my lawyer, and uh, he's saying, okay, we'll, we'll check all these out. I said, look, we want this one. We want Reebok. We want a, that we can fall in love with, that we could work with. Uh, he said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. see. See what happens. A week later, my lawyer came back, and he said, Joe, you got your wish. You can have Reebok. All the rest have little problems. You, you, you have problems. But with Reebok, uh, he said, but the register, the registrar, has said that with Reebok, if anybody comes along and says we're making shoes out of Reebok skin, you can't stop them. Oh, mm. Okay. Okay. And for that, because of that, they're putting you in the B section of the register. It's a register. We didn't know A section, B section. What's the difference? 
We were not interested. Uh, we said, that's why. And Jeff and myself said, nobody will ever make shoes out of Reebok skin and say that, you know. So we, we, we got Reebok. Ten years later, ten years later, the registrar came back to say, we've now put you in the A section of the register. Oh, right. Why is that? He said, well, everybody knows that Reebok is a running shoe. It is no longer simply an animal. So we took, we overtook the animal and Reebok became the shoe. So that's how we uh, <laughs> became Reebok. And, you know, the, that was probably our first, our first real sort of challenge as to, you know, when you set up a company, what can go wrong? Yeah, nothing. We're young, so it doesn't matter. You know, we were young at that time, and yeah, doesn't matter. Nothing can go wrong. And then 18 months in, we have to change our name. Now we can go to four years into our business. Do you want to ask me a question? <laughs> How important do you think a name is to a business? Oh, Because... Yeah. I would venture to guess you would you would be as successful if it was called Reebok or it was called Mercury or it's called J.W. Foster. That's my my perspective. But do you think that the name Reebok helped you that much? Um, I, I think it did. I, I think Reebok is a very simple name, hmm. very easy to say and very understandable. It's just two syllables, Reebok. And no matter how fast you say it, it just mm -hmm. comes over, you know. It's better than Adidas. You know, for me, it's better than Adidas. Um, Nike is pretty good, but, you know, somebody else got that name a bit later. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think a name is good for... Uh, if people can understand it and say it, and it's easy. Uh, you know, we travel, I travel with, with Julie now, and everywhere we go, and if we ask the question of, uh, well, what do you do? Oh, well, uh, found a Reebok. Reebok. Everybody knows the name now. It's been so it transmits easily. People pick it up easily. Um, you know, yeah. I, you all know Sacconi. Sorry to cut you off, though. You can, 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 yeah, continue on what you were saying before, though. About four years later. Yeah, four years later, we. Uh, this was our second challenge. We got a letter. A letter from the lawyers of Adidas. Because our silhouette, our silhouette had two stripes and a T-bar. That was our silhouette on the shoe. And uh, Adidas had decided that um, no, they didn't like that idea. So this, their lawyers sent a letter to say that our two stripes and a T-bar infringed their three stripes. Well, we opened this letter and Jeff and I were, oh, what's this now? So we think five minutes it took us probably to just think that through. Just a minute. Adidas know we're here. Adidas thought it worthy of sending us a letter to tell us that we're infringing them. Mm. That's great. We've, we're acknowledged. We pinned that on the wall. The letter's pinned on the wall. And we simply changed the silhouette from the T-bar to the vector, which is an arrow shape, which you probably recognize today as Reebok. And uh, for me, that became a better silhouette than the T-bar and two stripes. So we had a better silhouette. It was answering the problems. And from then on, it was like, oh, yippee, when we get a problem, that's that, that means we have, an, a, we have something, we have a challenge. When, to get a problem, it's a challenge. And with that challenge, how can we make it better? What can we do that improves our company, that we step up and do something better? So it, it has been ever since we started getting these challenges, any time when a problem comes along, it's, well, don't look at this as something bad. Look at this as an opportunity. So anything that came along, whatever, we would try to seek, on, seek things as being an opportunity. And uh, so you know, that's how we became Reebok and how, we became, how we, our silhouette improved to become the, uh, um, the vector. One of the challenges that you spoke about in previous podcasts that you've done is how other people around you suggested that it was important to get a job and everyone was saying, get a job, get a job. And I'm curious why you never 
ended up doing that. And um, what gave you the belief and fortitude of believing that Reebok was actually going to be a success? Well, I don't think you know how big a success or whether you, it will work. We knew very well that we could uh, we could succeed. We we knew because mm-hmm. we were growing slowly, local athletes, and then further. We, we were, our business was developing. Um, but of course, as, as you said, twenty one years to <laughs> from beginning, and we're still small. We you know growth is very difficult at, at sometimes. Um, and I, I think it's just keep on, you know, the strategy almost builds itself. The strategy is right. We need, we need to build. So I, I will start mm-hmm. selling. I'll go out in the car and I'll go to the retailers. And, and I used to, I went to the retailers and, uh, the retailers would say, yeah, nice shoes, nice product. Uh, but I've got, I've, well, I've got, I've got, uh, Adidas and, I, and I've got Dunlop. Why do I need Reebok? You know, after two or three times I'd been sort of suggested, why do I need Reebok? I realized they didn't need Reebok. They didn't need Reebok. What year is this? Oh, we're talking, uh, we're talking sort of maybe early 60s, uh, 65, 66, 67, that sort of time. They don't So need- eight years into the business. Eight years into the business, you you're you're hearing they don't need what I'm what I'm creating or right. what I'm selling, which is a crazy thing to hear eight years into something, and then say, you know what, I'm gonna continue. I have a feeling I'm having fun. This is enjoyable for me. This is working, but a little bit like what is the sales of Reebok if you had to guess in 1966? If you know, like what what would you what would you estimate at this time? Uh, probably under half a million dollars. Well, less than that, maybe four fifty, yeah. more for more four fifty thousand dollars. So, uh, and the reason it took time. First of all, we start by making shoes, and people come locally, so we have a local business. Uh, then I sort of um, got a couple of agents to represent. So I wouldn't I wouldn't hear what they were hearing, and. If you read the book, you'll find that we started in cycling. So we started cycling shoes. You know, we're being very good. We didn't want to compete with the, the Foster family that were on athletics. We'll, we'll just do cycle shoes. And uh, we advertised in Cycling Magazine. And a man from London, he obviously read our adverts that we were looking for agents. And we got this agent from London. And all of a sudden, orders Masses of orders were coming in. That's incredible. We, are, we, we had to employ people. <laughs> we, are, we needed people to help us make shoes. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, those orders from London stopped. <laughs> so, okay, what happened? We didn't have computers. We didn't have mobile phones. Uh, and unless somebody was in a certain place, you couldn't make a telephone call. So we had to write a letter. <sighs> Two weeks into the fact that all our orders are suddenly stopped. We receive a letter, and it was from um, our agent's landlady. He was actually a Scotsman, and he'd moved to London, and he was staying in the landlady, so he was in digs, as they call it. And uh, she said, "Does uh, Mister? I keep forgetting his name. Does he owe you any money? Do you owe, do you owe him any money? Um, because." Uh, Two weeks ago, he was killed in a motor accident, and he hadn't paid his rent. Oh my God! Um, that was the end of our cycle business, because, and it's then that I learned that he must have been such a fantastic salesman. Because a salesman is, first of all, a salesman has to sell himself. He has to be accepted by the buyer, and, mm. and if if you can sell yourself, <clears throat> fine. And he. And he was bringing his orders <clears throat> because once once he wasn't bringing the orders, the orders stopped. So, and it gave me a question that mm-hmm. if we were making such fantastic, fabulous cycle shoes that all these people were giving us orders, why why is those why do they stop? And today, I still don't know, except for the fact he must have been a super guy selling really good stuff and a good salesman. And that's what made me go out on the road 
well, I'm going to try this. And I went out on and that's when I got these answers. Well, um, yeah. Why do I need Reebok? No. Right. So that's when I thought, no, just a minute. I have to think about this. Well, we used to, at weekends, we used to go in a car with lots of products, <laughs> shoes in the boot, and we used to go around to races, running athletic meetings, and we would sell around the boot. And running was growing, lots more people out there. And I'm seeing 200 athletes go past me, and I'm thinking, they are my customers. Not the, not the shops. The shops are not my customers. These are my customers. So I think about it. And that all these athletes are part of the, an athletic club. They all belong to a club, and the clubs came to the races. And uh, we used to have the three A's, the Amateur Athletic Association. So all the clubs in the UK were all part of the three A's. And the three A's produced a handbook. And the handbook had the name and address of every club secretary in the country. This is a good opportunity. A letter to each of the clubs, offering them 15% off. And if anybody in the club wanted to become an agent, they could have the 15%. Well, first letter, 100 agents. Second letter, another 50. In the end, I had about 250 agents, all in the clubs around the country and orders coming in. And I was receiving retail money, less 15. So it was making money. Then I'm getting mm -hmm. phone calls. Those shopkeepers who said, why do I need Reebok? All of a sudden, they needed Reebok. Because they on the telephone they're saying, I believe you're selling direct to our athletic club, our local club. And I said, yes, yes, we're selling direct. Well, you stop doing that and we'll buy your shoes. Oh, all of a sudden, they need me. All of a sudden, they need my product. And I said, no, I'm not going to stop selling direct. They only get 15% off. You would get wholesale price, which is more than half the price off. You can give the athletes 15%. I'm sure you would do that without a problem. Some didn't accept it, but I think about 90% of the retailers accepted that idea. So I started, again, we started to grow. Uh, but I have a problem. And that is that uh, the UK, we only have, well, we 65 million people at that time. Um, and the USA had 350 million people. And they'd got uh, much more spending power. They had much more disposable income than in the UK. In fact, we, we did some research with it. And uh, if you put the USA spending capacity at 100 percent the uk was down at 19. japan was about 25 and germany wow. was also about 25. so you can see the comparison like for like we were only 20 percent in terms of the income disposable income of somebody who worked and lived in england as against somebody who worked and lived in america what year is this this is 1968 and I'm thinking, I was, I've got to get into America. I've got to get that, that market. Because every university, every college, they have coach. And coach is God. And you can go to a college on an athletic scholarship. You've got to make inroads. Well, the family didn't like the idea of spending the money on me going to America to try and knock on doors. It had been difficult enough in the UK. What would it be like in America? like virtually impossible. However, this was a good thing happened now. I'm reading a magazine called Eurosport and there's an advertisement from the British government. And the British government say, we want you to export. And for that, we will, we will pay for a stand at the NSGA show in Chicago, that's National Sporting Goods Association. We'll, we'll pay for the stand. We'll also pay for your return airfare. And we'll pay 50% of your hotel bill. No more objections. Mm. Oh, no. Pretty good deal. Pretty good deal, yeah. You couldn't, couldn't beat that. So in 1968, February, I'm off to Chicago. And you don't live too far from Chicago, so you'll know pretty what well it's like in February in Chicago. It is freezing. But... 
we're going we're going to see what uh, what it's all about in fact I, I went with a friend a friend joined me on this one and we came into New York we stayed in Times Square and uh, he he was in the outdoor uh, business I was in the sporting goods business so I looked at the sports stores he looked at the out outdoor stores and that was great and I can remember we used to we, we dined for a few days at Tad's Steak Bar I don't know if Tad's Steak Bar I don't think they're there anymore Tad's Steak Bar for a dollar one dollar you could get a big steak and a massive Idaho potato with a slab of butter <laughs> that was great absolutely great we love you know it. how much that runs you these days I'll go on probably fifty dollars. <laughs> it's like probably Times Square, so a yeah. hundred fifty to hundred bucks. <laughs> Crazy. Well, it was just a dollar in those days, so you can imagine. Well, great. Then we moved on to Chicago, and I'm at the Chicago Fair, and that's good. And guys are coming in, and it was a bit like going to the sports shops in England. The, the guys are saying, "Lovely product, wonderful. Where do I get that from?" And I'm saying, "England." Yeah. Is that is that New England? No, no, it's not New England. It's England, you know, across the pond, right? Across the. Oh, is that near London? Yes, near London. Oh, I realised I needed a distributor. <laughs> I need somebody in America to. Mm. You know, we didn't have the money to to set up a business, which is you know you've got to have quite a bit of capital to set a business up wholesale and set the whole thing up. Well, this is 1968. When did I get there? 1979. I made it in 1979. I had six failures on the room. Six different people, all tried, all pushing. A bit like me going to the stores. Why do I need Reebok? Why do I? But we come back now to the late 60s. Um, late 60s, a company, um, well, it was a magazine, Runner's World. Um, Bob Anderson, he was doing this, just a single page. Just one single page. By 1975, that was a full-blown 50-page color magazine telling everybody, this is where you go for your next race. Mm. These are the people who won the last races. Everything throughout America, everybody was buying that magazine. And Bob Anderson, in his wisdom, thought, I know everything about this. I'll tell everybody which is the best shoe to buy. So oh. they did some some type of testing, and it came up with uh, Nike. Hmm. As you'd expect. I mean, Nike, they were in Did Oregon. that frustrate you? Pardon? Did you believe you had the best shoe, and, and did you believe or know you had the best shoe at that time, and did it frustrate you when this magazine doesn't have your shoe as the number one shoe at that time? I, I, I'm never really worried about being the number one shoe. What I was really worried about was marketing, how you sell your product, mm. not whether your product. And, and it's the marketing that really does makes the difference. You know, if somebody else says this is a number one shoe, then a lot of people believe it. So this was the influence. So it, it's how do you influence people? You've got mm. a right product. Um, <clears throat> we had a good product. In fact, I think it was, <clears throat> I'm trying to think now, it was 1969 that Ron Hill won the Boston Marathon in a pair of Reeboks and he won it in record time. So he brought the record for the Boston Marathon and he did it in Reebok, which is great. <clears throat> but there was no Reebok product available on the market. So yeah, it's how do you, so there was this series of events, marketing, then availability. And uh, <clears throat> okay, we could advertise in, in Runner's World. And if Runner's World had have said, no, Reebok is number one, we wouldn't have been able to do anything because with nothing set up to do that. Um, and as it was, even even Phil Knight, Phil Knight at Nike, all of a sudden, he's number one. There's about, in those days, about 350 million Americans. 10% were out running by that time. So 35 million Americans were out there running. And we'll say 10% of those, uh, three and a half million, oh, this is the number one shoe. We must have the number one shoe. Could they get it? No. Phil Knight was bringing his shoes in from uh, from the far east, from, from Japan to begin with. He could, he could never, he could never, he could never fulfil those orders. And the retailers, the big stores, who everybody's knocking on the door saying, "I want a pair of those uh, Nikes," we don't have them. No, so they were getting frustrated. 
However, one year later, Bob Anderson thinks, well, yeah, OK, now we, we must have a, a different number one shoe. And he did. He's, this is, I think it may have been New Balance or Sacconi, Brooks, Retonic, you, I don't know which one. But he said, this isn't, this isn't a number one shoe. Same thing happened. The retailers couldn't get them. A lot of people wanted to buy. However, <laughs> he either changed his mind or somebody, helped, somebody said, you can't keep doing this, Bob. You've got to get it. You know, it's killing the industry. So he changed to a star rating. <clears throat> and five stars would be the best, which meant probably three, four maybe shoes would get five stars. So that's spreading the, uh, the opportunity. I knew we could make a five star shoe. This is where we, this is what we could do. Making a number one shoe, you either had to be advertising, the best advertiser in Runner's World, yes, we spent a lot of money with him, um, but it was a lottery. We couldn't do that. So, uh, right. And, and I've been over to uh, Los Altos, I think it is just outside uh, San Francisco, and I've been over to see Bob Anderson. Got on with quite well, great, this is, but, and, and he was helpful, very helpful. <clears throat> so, right. I thought, yeah, we, we can make a number one shoe. So we produced what we call, it was the gold range. And the gold range was a spike track shoe called the Inca, uh, a road racing shoe, which was Midas, and Aztec. Aztec would be our trainer, and Aztec would be the volume. We actually tested the whole product range out in Edmonton, in Canada, for the Commonwealth Games. We got a shed load of medals. We were great. Fantastic. And in 1979, our shoe was up there to be tested to get a five-star rating. Well, I'm in Chicago in 1979 in February. And uh, by that time, running, athletic shoes were in such demand. And the guy from uh, Kmart, you all know Kmart, big, uh, big stores, uh, came in and said, uh, we want 25,000 pairs. They were happy to take any running shoe. They'd seen us, we'd advertise in Runner's World and think, oh, 25,000 pounds. That was about six months' work for our factory. We're not such a big factory, but see. Right. However, I have friends, and this was one of the things that we developed, friendships in, in the industry. And Barter, Barter, they were the biggest shoemakers in the world in those days. And uh, I had a friend who was setting up the sports division. And he said, look, Joe, you get any orders, you get a five-star rating. We'll help you. We'll make the shoes. Great. But then the guy from Kmart said, but we want a better price. Oh. That meant going to South Korea, Asia. That's where you're going to get your better price. I had also made uh, acquaintance with uh, some guys who were the agents for the biggest factory in South Korea. So we had that covered as well. But Kmart, Kmart, mm, not really what I thought was the image for Reebok. However, <clears throat> we'll, we'll think about that. Then along came Paul Fireman. Paul Fireman was running a company called Boston Camping. Boston Camping, they were selling tents, fishing lines, all the bits and pieces for the outdoor world. That was it. <sighs> I could tell from where he was. He was pretty fed up at just doing the same thing. He'd been doing it for about 10 years. And, you know, you're just doing the same thing and you're not going anywhere. And he said, Joe, he said, you get a five star shoe, I'll be your I'll be your distributor. I said, Paul, come and have a look at Aztec. And so I bring the Aztec out. Paul he said, I'm impressed, but it's not a five star shoe yet, is it? No, but it will be. <laughs> I'm convinced it will be, Paul. Okay. If you get a five star shoe, Joe What are the components that make up a five star shoe? Lightweight, cushioned, uh, grip, long wearing sole, you know, good heel, you know, your supination and pronation. You've got to make sure that uh, your balance is right. So all those things came together to make, in those days, a five-star shoe. And we were, we were well into the industry. We knew what we were doing, you know, a bit like Elon Musk now making uh, electric cars. He knows what he's doing. You know, if you know what you're doing, you've got a good chance of having a business. So uh, hmm. this is February. The uh, shoe edition doesn't come out until uh, uh, until August. Okay. So I go out to America after I've been 
came back from February, went to uh, America to have a look at the Kmart operation. And that really convinced me because the guy who'd come to see me was one of about 60 different salesmen or buyers, 60 different buyers in one room and they all had their own desk. And I'm thinking, I need it more personal. I, I need to have a relationship here. And that guy who's out of the buyer, he may not be there in six months' time. And if he is, he's going to make sure that whatever my product, if I sell that, my product, his uh, his boss works on square footage. And if our shoes are not selling enough to for that square footage, that will be my first and last order for 25,000 pairs. So I'm not convinced. So I, I leave... Mm. Uh, what we did it? Um, I forgot my name. But I won't go over to Boston to see Paul. And Paul's running this small outfit with his brother and his brother-in-law. And I think, this would be nice. Just bolt this on, a nice run issue range with uh, what Paul is doing. Okay, I go back. End of July, the Runner's World magazine is due for publication. I phone Paul. It's probably early morning for him, maybe midday for me. Uh, I said, Paul, just go down to the local kiosk and see if they've got Runner's World and how we did with uh, five stars. So I'm waiting. An hour later, Paul came back. Joe, Aztec, five stars. You got it. Oh, oh, we made it. That's it. We're in. He said, not only that, Inca and Midas also got five stars. Got three five star shoes. That got us into America. That was it. We were in. Instead of us pushing out the door all the time, mm -hmm. all of a sudden we were in demand. There was a, a we were in, and I got people who could make them in barter, and we we're going to get the right price out of South Korea. There's a lot of story in between, and if you read the book. You'll pick up all the bits and pieces in between that. But we're now in America. And this is 1979 or 1980. And when, what year was this? 79. 1979. And so did your brother see this? Did your brother see or hear that message? Or he did hear the this message. after yeah. he passed? He did hear the message, but uh, unfortunately, wow. he, within within weeks, he uh, he died of stomach cancer, which was, I mean, it was only wow. earlier today I was talking again on a on a at a meeting uh, talking about Reebok, and uh, and the question was, what was the biggest disaster that happened to you? And that happened to be the biggest disaster, is that my brother we worked hard, we'd worked to get this, but. Jeff loved the factory. He loved being in the factory. That was he, and he used to say, "Joe, you know, leave the factory to me. You do everything else." Oh. And it, it seemed to work. You know, I was I was doing things and whatever, and trying to build the marketing, the name, the reputation, the product. Uh, whereas he just he just made the shoes. So that worked. But unfortunately, yeah, just as we just as we got there, he, unfortunately, he died, which is. Yeah, there's a sudden shift in, in in what you do in a business. And probably the one thing that did happen is that I probably got more determined. I probably got, we're going to do it. Uh, uh, just to just to prove that we were there, we could do it. And so it took me three, diff, three people to replace him in different ways, two, three people. But, uh, and, and that was the point. Because we were needing to go to the Far East, Jeff would have gone to the Far East and taken the patterns and everything and gone and supervised factories in the Far East. Um, he couldn't do that, so I had to do it. I, I, I had to take that on. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it, I mean, I, I didn't take it on for too long, but uh, and, uh, we were growing, and as such, I needed other people. And Paul Fireman, we got a team with Paul Fireman, um, because that was going to be the big market, <clears throat> we essentially got that team to work from America. So uh, that that brings me back just to being a, a well, selling the company again, you know, or selling shoes. I've got to sell sell mm. the shoes. I've got to build the company. 
but we're now in America. And, uh, and, I, and I guess in a way, getting Paul Feynman in at that point, sort of, I don't say it replaced Jeff, but it took the energy into America, the energy for the brand we transferred from the UK into America. For me, America was the market, the big market. And uh, if we, uh, oh, well, just a minute, what have I done with that? I've lost something there. Can I hit that? I want it go. No, I, how do I get rid of this there? Oh, cancel. It's all right. It's all right. I got back again. I hit a button. I shouldn't have hit. <laughs> but I'm back again. There we go. <laughs> um, essentially, what had happened is we took, say, we took the energy into America and we started to get the sales and started to build, build the, the brand. But, you know, that's not what built Reebok. What built Reebok was aerobics. We're a running company. And we arrived there, but it's aerobics. And this happened because Arnold Martinez, he was he was a tech rep down in Los Angeles. Um, you'll know what a tech rep is. A tech rep, he doesn't sell the product. He goes around and tells everybody, tells all the salesmen in the stores, these are the good features, this is what you're doing. It. And probably does a bit of spiffing. In other words, if you were a salesman and you sell my product, we'll give you a dollar for everyone you sell. So... Those things went on in America. I don't know if they do anymore, but uh, I was spiffing. Anyway, uh, his wife, Frankie. His wife, Frankie, is uh, coming home from these classes, and she's full of it. And Arnold's saying, what are you doing? Uh, well, it's aerobics. What's aerobics? Well, we're actually exercising to music. Oh, yeah. And... They were so full of it. Arnold said, Why is that? can I come down to your next uh, class and see what's going on? Which he did. He went down there and he saw the instructor in a pair of uh, sneakers. We think they must have been, they were, we think they were probably New Balance. Half the class in the same product, <clears throat> the other half wearing no shoes at all. This is what he thought, why don't, why don't Reebok make a shoe for aerobics? Specifically for women on a woman's last and make it out of glove leather. Soft, cushioned. Brilliant idea. But he's in Los Angeles. Paul Fireman is in Boston. So he had to take the next flight he could over to, out to Boston and sit in with uh, Paul. <laughs> Paul, Paul, look, we've got to get into this. And Paul's saying, I hope, slow down, slow down. We're a running company. Why do we want to make women's dancing shoes? Oh, he tried, but Paul just wanted him to slow down. Keep an eye on it. But Arnold was too full of us. He, so he went round to the back door and had a word with Steve Liggett. Steve Liggett, uh, at that time, he, he was our product manager. He looked after product. And he must have made, he must have convinced Steve better than he convinced Paul. Because... He managed to get 200 pairs of samples, took them down to L.A. and gave them to the instructors, some of the leading girls down there, and they loved it. And when Jane Fonda... How, out, how long did that happen? How I long won't... between the time of Anne Hill taking the idea to those 200 pairs? We're talking about 1982. And... It, it would have taken about three or four months. And, and how long of that period? It would have taken about three or four three months. months. Cool. Interesting. From, uh, from saying I want some samples and actually getting the samples made in Korea and sent down to LA. So it would take two or three months. And it, I would imagine Arnold was probably chewing his fingernails and you know, wanted to get into this. Uh, but when they did arrive, they were a tremendous success. They were a great success, although there were a lot of fault. A lot of faults in it. You don't make uh, you don't make a shoe out of glove leather. It just rips apart. I mean, you can you can rip glove leather just like you can do a piece of paper. Um, so they lined it with nylon, and I'm saying, look, guys, if you line it with nylon, you take away the most important thing about leather, and that it breathes. Leather breathes. You stick nylon on the back, you stop it breathing. So what did they do? They punched holes in it holes in the front, nice pattern of holes to allow it to breathe. Lesson for me, marketing is better 
than manufacturing. Marketing can tell manufacturers. Manufacturers hmm. can get, you know, I could say, no, this is wrong, this is wrong. But marketing decided on this. So the design, the marketing, and that was a successful product. I mean, eventually, it, we were a $9 million company when uh, when Arto thought of, why don't we go into this? A year later, we were $30 million. And the year after that, we were $90 million. $300 million, $900 million successive years. All of a sudden, from almost zero to a billion in less than five years. Yeah, that was it. Fantastic. What happens mentally? What happens mentally when you have that rapid of a, of growth after 20 plus years of toiling away at it and now you have just an unfathomable amount of growth? What happens to you mentally? How do you, how do you compartmentalize all of that growth? I don't think you do. For me, it didn't work that way. For me, it was like, okay, we're climbing a hill. Now we've got the opportunity. Let's climb it. I think there was more an excitement at saying, mm -hmm. okay, we keep pushing at these doors. We keep pushing at these. All of a sudden, this is pulling us. We're no longer pushing the business. It's essentially dragging us along because how do we keep up with demand? You know, the whole thing had changed into now, can we keep up with that demand? What do we need? Uh, we had a bit of luck. Just as we started to require a lot of production, you, know, you, you remember I was talking about Bob Anderson saying that Nike was number one. They couldn't get the product. Well, by now, Nike was a big company, but they ran into a wall. And uh, they had to come out of three factories in Korea, in South Korea. They had to come out of the factory because they were, over, were overproduced just at the time when we needed those factories. So that's a piece of timing and luck that happened for Reebok. We could go into those factories and take the product and have the product made. So we managed to retain the leadership in aerobics. It would have been so easy for us to lose that because how do you start producing when you're only doing 9 million, then you go to 30 million. But how do you get from 300 million to 900 million? That was the time when we needed the production. And uh, again, there are a lot of stories along the road. I, I know the first thing that happened is that Steve Liggett had gone over to Korea. And in order to get a production line, he had to take that for, he had to have a production line for a day. He, he had to run the whole thing. <clears throat> and that was probably a thousand pair of shoes. And then, and I think he had to book it up in advance. So he had to book these production lines. Um, Paul Fireman was, when he heard about it, he was going crazy because he couldn't afford it. You know, all these shoes coming in, and yet the demand was growing, growing, growing. But it was this question of, will the demand take the production that Steve Liggett has booked? So we booked in to take the production. So again, we needed, we needed help. And help came by the way of a guy called Stephen Rubin. Stephen Rubin uh, is UK but he's also a sourcing company. And he sourced from the Far East and sold, and he, he liked to sell anywhere in the world. Um, so he gave uh, Paul Fireman a credit line, because when you're dealing with the Far East, they want you to put the money up front. You've got to put it in the bank, and but the bank won't pay unless you can pay. So we needed somebody to, uh, to finance it, and Stephen Rubin financed it. He, uh, he gave... Uh, Paul Feynman a credit line and when that credit line got to $250,000 he was worried million. oh sorry <laughs> $250 million <laughs> he was a little worried <laughs> you can imagine you're, you're owed $250 million so that is the sort of wow uh, I don't say it's a, it is a problem because you know you, you're spending more money eventually of course it starts to turn over and the money starts to turn around. But to get to that level, you need somebody who can, uh, who can manage that sort of debt. So, and this is, this is going back to the 80s, 1980s. So today, how many billions would that require? And, uh, so this, this was, you know, you've got to have, first of all, the opportunity to make the product because well, I suppose, first of all, you've got to create the demand. So the demand was there. Women, all of a sudden, Reebok were a woman's sports shoe. We, we were no, we were not, 
we're not Adidas, we're not Nike, we're not sweating. No, we're, we're making shoes for women. Nice. Women glow, men sweat. You know, it's like we're different. All of a sudden, we're different, perceived differently as a company just for women. And both Nike and, wow. and Adidas, Nike in particular, just thought, yeah, it's just a small fad, this, it won't happen. But it took us to become number one. We overtook Nike, we overtook Adidas, and we became number one global sports footwear brand. And we were able to then expand into basketball, American football, you name it. We, we could expand into that. And and so you you have this rapid growth from 1979 to 1984, and then you exit the company or sell the company. And how difficult of a decision is that at that point when you have built this thing from the ground up? I'm sure you felt like it was your baby, and now you're giving over the reins to somebody else. Was that difficult for you? Not that difficult. Uh, the, two reasons for this. One is that... Uh, Probably my energy um, and my usefulness for the company was to face the challenge, to get it to grow, to get it to a position where it had the opportunity to become big. And then you need other people. You need a lot of other people. And the opportunity came in order for Stephen Rubin to actually fund that company. He needed to he needed to have some control. He wouldn't. We wouldn't have had $250 million just, just like that. We, he needed, so for me, it was a decision. Do we lose the opportunity or do we give Reebok the opportunity to grow? So giving Reebok the opportunity mm -hmm. to grow, I would always be founder, whatever. People come, people go, but you can't change a founder. So as a founder, that for me, that was great. It was, this was the opportunity. For the, for the company to become massive. So making that decision was not as hard as you think. It was a matter of, I mean, to have not done that would have been the potential for failure was so big at that time because mm. had somebody else come in and started making aerobic shoes and just take the market, we wouldn't have been big enough to even fight against it. The fact that we could just continue, continue, continue to supply that market and we still had trouble. Uh, even with all that, we're still we're still fighting to get enough product, which you know, it, it, in whatever time you run a business, it's it's always about how do we market, how do we sell, how do we increase the market. Here, the market was expanding that fast, but uh, we were trying to keep up. You know, marketing wasn't a problem. The problem was how do you how do you sustain that market? How do you how do you manage to uh, keep supplying it? So that became our biggest problem. And uh, I say we grew and we grew to a size that we were bigger than both Adidas and, and Nike. So when people say, you know, what would you change? And people have asked that, what would you change if you went back? And all I can say is, look, we became number one. What more can you do? We became number one. Reebok became number one. You know, and it's uh, so. Yeah, if if I had not accepted, not decided to sell, we maybe wouldn't. You maybe would, we, we would certainly wouldn't be talking. I don't think because Reebok wouldn't have become what it became. Sixty percent of Americans during the eighties had a pair of Reebok. That's a lot of people, and a lot of people remember, and they remember. Uh, I, I meet a lot of people now, and they're probably in the fifties, and uh, they've made money now, and they keep on saying, "Oh, sure." I remember when Pump came out, we loved them, but I couldn't afford them. You know, they had to save up, save to buy a pair of Pump. <laughs> and everybody remembers D. Brown uh, dunking from the halfway line, just you know, just doing the basket from the halfway line, then bending down and pumping up his shoes. They all remember that. It, you know, so those sort of things, it, they, it, they're just sort of I, iconic. You know, they, they say something that doesn't change. It's something that this is Reebok. And now Reebok is such a sort of iconic brand. It's there and so many people love it. Yeah, no doubt about it. And, you know, you obviously, you mentioned Phil Knight before, and I'm curious about your perspective on him. 
Did you ever cross paths with him? And what do you think of Phil Knight as somebody who recently wrote a book, similarly built a, a global brand? Yeah. Were Were you familiar with him at the time? And how did uh, how did his his did he have any impact on you? Um, I never met Phil Knight. I did meet uh, Jeff Johnson. I don't know if you've read Phil Knight's book. Have you read his book? Shoe Dog. You've read a while back, yeah. A while back. Well, if you remember reading that. When it uh, came out. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Johnson was the guy who was bugging him, saying, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. He was writing to him two letters a day, and Phil Knight was getting up, yeah. <clears throat> and this was Jeff Johnson. Um, Jeff Johnson was the one who came up with the word Nike. And uh, because if you, if you read the book, Phil Knight didn't know what to call it. <laughs> he, he, he was Blue Ribbon Sports. <laughs> he, no, Blue Ribbon Sports. But uh, Nike came out of Jeff Johnson. And, and I think the idea for the swoosh, although it was a girl who actually did, drew the swoosh. Um, my relation, I've never met him. I, I, I would like to meet Phil Knight. Uh, he, he came at it. Our stories are very similar. If you if you read my book, uh, having read um, Shoe Dog, I think you'll find we did a lot of things. Same. Had I been born in America, maybe my life would have been different. Maybe we'd have been bigger earlier. Maybe I wouldn't have sold. I don't know because these are they're all the ifs and what maybes. I came from a manufacturing background. Uh, Phil Knight came from a counting background, so he, he was more of a bean counter. You know. He, he did that. I came from product side. So we came from different sides and arrived almost at the same place in a different way at different times. But now I have a great respect for him. And, uh, you know, people say, you know, Nike, Adidas, they must have been your competitors. What did you think about it? Um, and my response, well, not really. We, you know, we just thought of our own business and we just looked, uh, you know, for the white spaces. And aerobics is a very good example of a white space you know this it it wasn't there we found it we sourced it we we made it so you're looking for the spaces and and i think that's what you do you try and pick up your business where you, you know you're not trying to beat somebody you're just trying to get there in a different way and uh, so that there are always white spaces i mean right now we've got the metaverse and wherever that's going to take everybody but these are spaces Will they work? Will they not? You know, NFTs, what is all this about? Uh, cryptos, yeah, so many things which are so different from, you know, the, from my time when I was in that age of excitement. I mean, you, you young, ready to move, you know, you're ready, you'll pounce on whatever it is. Right now you're podcasting. This is one of the ways. So, you know, your, your journey, this is part of it. You know, but where's it going to lead? You know, you, are you going to become the number one podcaster in the world? Is there such a thing as a number one podcaster? You know, it's it's all a question of this is going to lead you somewhere. You know, whether it's into the metaverse or whether where will it be crypto. You know, what is this? Where is it? Where is it all leading? Um, my day it was product, and my day we competed, and you know, we grew a product. You will choose whether you pivot, how you can take your next step. This is something because. What you're doing now, you wouldn't do if you were just somebody who wanted a job, just somebody who was willing to do something simple. Mm -hmm. No, you've made a decision. You're going to challenge something. You're going to get up there, and uh, yeah, and, and it's love it. We love it. We love meeting people like you. It's great because you know I see that enthusiasm. I mean, you know, people ask me, "Well, what would you be doing now if you had all this?" How do I know? How do I know? Yeah, I would certainly. Want, <laughs> I would certainly make sure that I knew everything about technology. I would have all the information about mm. technology. And, you know, where it goes from there, I don't know, because, you know, I don't know everything about technology. As we learned, jury has to do my technology. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, so someone like us, similar to us, is, uh, is George Heaton. I don't know if you're familiar with George Heaton. He's got a great company called Represent, and he's built it from the ground up. He's actually done product and he sells clothes and designs clothes and creates clothes. But he actually was, uh, was a guest on this podcast and he asked a question to you um, where he said, if you had to create a shoe today at this point, what shoe would it be and what sport would it be focused on? <laughs> you think you'd ask me that question? 
<laughs> well, and you know, <laughs> my answer. Yeah, my, he asked it to you earlier. My answer would be: if I was twenty-five years old, I'd, I'd be able to tell you, because that, that's where fashion's created, <laughs> where the future's created. It's not created yeah. when you're eighty-seven. You know, I'm, I'm just lucky to have gone through that, and we did create a, a five-star shoe, because in those days, a five-star shoe meant something. Yeah. So I need I need to go back and say, take me back and maybe twenty five years old, and then give me a, a month or two, and I'll tell you, I'll give you an answer. But you know where I am now, it's it's a pleasure to talk to people like you because you're the future. You know, youth. That's yeah. where these crazy ideas come from. This is where the different things come from, and this is this, this is what will be the future, and. Uh, it's great. It's great to uh, to experience all what's going on now. It, it really is. So, you know, the future's well, fantastic. It's it's incredible because you have such an incredible respect and humility. It seems like for youth and for people who are doing things and changing the world and trying to experiment. A lot of people's perspective on the metaverse and and on new technologies and new shifts in culture is to be upset at it. Why do you think you are excited about it and looking at it in a positive way? Like what what about your personality or mindset allows you to appreciate youth and the culture that's coming up now? Well, I mean everything's changed in my life from how we used to communicate and social media Everything is moving and totally different. <clears throat> and, and I think if you if you don't acknowledge, even if you don't understand, you don't acknowledge that this is incredible. The speed at which things are moving, yeah, you know, that is that is so. You know, you talk about me, and we took uh, I took eleven years to start and eventually end up in America. Now you can do this in eleven seconds. You know, it's like you know, whatever it is, you, you've got to do this. So. Being, you know, the changes, I think, are just, it just sort of, it is so incredible to think that people are not doing it the same way that I did it when I was 25. Because, yeah, this is how the world moves on. You know, like I say, we didn't have computers. We didn't have mobile phones. You know, if I wanted to contact people in the early days in America, I had to write a letter. In fact, if you read the book, you find I had one of them during those 11 years, one of the guys, I had him for four years, and we exchanged letters. After letters. In fact, the biggest problem was that we'd write a letter, and he'd write a letter, and they would cross. Then we'd be... <laughs> so the letters were not making any sense in the end. <laughs> Everything had changed. By the time I wrote back, I, he's writing about something else. Oh. So I, right now, I mean, and that was then to, to do a global business then. <laughs> And say so it was really difficult in terms of communication. You know, we, we had um, telex machines. That was the quickest way. A telex machine, it was just like a phone line. Uh, but you, you had to type it all out, and it came out in a, 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 a sort of piece of paper. And you had to feed this through a machine, which then sent it off very quickly to wherever it was going. But... Uh, it's a bit like, uh, you know, when you abbreviate something in order to get it, make it small. Uh, telegrams, they used to have telegrams. and But by the time you'd made it so small, instead of it sounding like you were happy with something, it almost sounded as though you were shouting at somebody. Like, what? what's that? So it it mm. came across bad. Now, I mean, I had to jump on an airplane to go and meet people. That's what I had to do. Now we could talk. Yeah, you know, we can have a chat, and uh, if, if we miss out on something, you can come back in a few minutes later and say, oh, by the way, Joel, and you, we never got around to talk about blah, 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 whatever it is. We can do that. I mean, totally different. I mean, right now things can get past you before we've seen them. But, you know, there's so many opportunities now. And that's the good thing, I think, about technology. Technology is opening up opportunity, opportunity, different things. You know, the guy that first made the, the, the first NFT and made he's only about 14 or whatever, and made millions out of it. I mean, that, that it, it blows your mind, doesn't it? <laughs> it really does. And it makes you think, wow, how did this happen? So I think it's exciting. Today is really uh, an exciting time. Absolutely. So, yeah, but 
you know, yeah. my time was exciting in its own way. And as I said, you know, most important mm. thing is to have fun. And, you know, got to have fun. Well, Mr. Foster, I I think that's a beautiful place to come to a close. I'm really grateful for you spreading the message and just being such a kind, curious, um, content, happy you're just a really amazing soul, and I'm really grateful that we crossed paths here today. And um, I, I'm just really appreciative for all the knowledge you shared. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, I am also pleased we crossed paths. And uh, who knows when we're over in New York? You know, we keep in contact. We may we may have the chance to have a coffee, something like that. <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's good fun. And enjoy your life. <laughs> enjoy. Fifth of September. Yes. First of September, we're in New York. There you are. Julie tells me now. First of September. Oh, it's amazing. So there you go. We'll keep in touch. Awesome. Well, well uh, hopefully we'll be able to connect then. Hopefully, yes. Why not? So Thank you so hey, much, Joe. It's a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure, Danny. Absolutely. Thank you. And, uh, well, Ho have fun. Hope you have a wonderful day. And uh, check out the book. The book is is uh, something that I'm definitely going to be reading soon. That's it. That's 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 the excitement today is to sell more books. 